Und alles geht? Thank you, Garrett. Good morning. So, third or fourth day of DrupalCon. I hope the coffee starts to kick in and I'll try to be as uh, entertaining as possible at that time of day. So, let's start and get the less important things out of the way. In that case, that's me. My name is Jochen Lirich. I'm from Germany. Um, and as one starts with uh, rounds like this, hello, my name is Jochen and I'm a sysadmin. And this is where you say, hello Jochen. <laughs> um, I've heard uh, found Linux in about 1993 during my uh, studies of computer science and instantly fell in love with it, started um, doing system administration, started my own first business already uh, during my studies and uh, in consequence nearly failing my graduation. Um, then I worked as a SUSE certified Linux trainer for some time, became an IT manager at uh, WebDE, which is one of the biggest web portals in Germany. Then uh, one and one uh, acquired WebDE, so I changed to one and one and became head of IT core services there, um, leading at three teams with uh, uh, 10 persons each. Um, doing system administration, providing basic IT services like um, backup systems for 50,000 servers, um, software deployment, all kinds of automation. So um, that's when I started to specialize in topics like I'm presenting today. And in 2009, I decided to found another business and started uh, early 2010 with my company Frysteel IT and the product that uh, I presented first at the Drupal Developer Days in Munich in 2010 which is called Drupal Concept. At Frysteel IT we have the motto Ops for Devs so we do IT stuff that um, helps developers be more productive, be more efficient and our main product is named Drupal Concept, which is a platform as a service or infrastructure as a service for, uh, that's completely optimized for Drupal. Uh, we do the management of the whole infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure is completely automated. And uh, so our customers, which mostly are development um, shops and agencies, can concentrate and focus on developing uh, websites, building websites, consulting their clients, but they don't have to get up early in the night because some hard disk has failed. And the lessons we learned uh, building Drupal Concept and the complete infrastructure um, are mostly about automating IT systems. We are running now um, more than 150 servers with a two-person team. 
And uh, when I started thinking about what to present here at DrupalCon, um, it didn't take long to, to get to the topic, okay, uh, how can I use this automation knowledge in a development setup? When we're talking about development setups, um, they, there are a few challenges. Having a local development setup makes you free to work wherever you are. You have, uh, if you have a development setup on your laptop, you can work at the office as well as on the train, on the plane, and um, so you can use uh, your development environment wherever you are. That's uh, handy, but it requires a lot of effort installing and maintaining. So um, sometimes you lose a lot of time by installing a new development setup at the beginning of a project, uh, maintaining it, doing software upgrades and all those, all those things. Another problem is um, the, well, it worked on my machine syndrome. Um, when launching a website on a production environment and finding out that something doesn't work as it's expected to do because there was a mismatch in software versions, another version of a um, PHP extension, for example, and uh, other things that um, have to be as equal as possible between the development environment, uh, your staging environment, and your production environment. There are software versions, um, there are dependencies between software components, there are updates that um, require you to update your software on every environment, and this takes a lot of time if you're doing it manually. I'm happy to say that there are now tools that help you to minimize the time you spend maintaining your development environment that help you to make sure that your development environment um, is set up similarly this, uh, than the production environment and that help you to reproduce a setup every time you need it. So you won't have to fear that the development setup you use with your new project will differ in any way from the one you are used to from the previous project. There are mainly two tools I want to introduce you to today. Uh, the first is named Vagrant. Who of you already heard of Vagrant? Hands up. Okay, so I won't, step, so I won't waste much time um, explaining what Vagrant is. Vagrant is a Ruby gem, so, uh, a package that uh, uses VirtualBox to build VMs um, from a central configuration. It makes setup of VMs very, very easy. You just need a few commands to get a new VM up and running. The first step you do is to install Vagrant, which you usually do via the gem command. With gem install Vagrant, um, you will download the Vagrant package, download all dependencies, and install them. The commands that follow are the usual commands of a Vagrant cycle. Um, first, you need something that's called a base box, which is an image of a pre-installed operating system. In this case, I use Vagrant box add to download and install a Linux VM image that's based on Ubuntu 12.04 and uh, especially its 64-bit version. The Vagrant box add <laughs> command will now download the image from the URL that's on the command line, store it on a central location on your computer, and from then on, you can reuse it to set up as, much, uh, as many VMs you'd like to. 
If you uh, want to start up a, a new VM, it's easy. You just create a directory where all the necessary configuration files will be put. Then you do a vagrant init precise 64, referencing the base box uh, you've downloaded before. And with Vagrant up, you'll have a running VM after about a minute or so. Finally, to use your box, uh, you can SSH into the box just by issuing the command Vagrant SSH. So you don't have to deal with um, local IP addresses or things like that. Vagrant um, gives you an efficient command line interface to do, to, to do everything you need. Before I'll show you how that works, um, just a few words about the boxes. Those vagrant boxes are pre-configured with mostly a minimal setup and you can download them from files.vagrantup.com where there's a community repository of predefined virtual box images you can use. Of course, uh, you will also be able to build your own boxes. Uh, uh, these commands help you with that. Uh, you can use Vagrant Box and different options and Vagrant Package to build your own um, Vagrant images. And there's another tool that will uh, make that process even more easy. That's called Vivi. It's uh, um, created by Patrick Dubois, which everyone in the DevOps world should already have heard of. All you need to spin up a new Vagrant VM is the Vagrant file, which is a uh, small file containing configuration commands. Uh, basically, it's Ruby, but it's a domain-specific language, so you don't need to be able to um, code in Ruby to configure Vagrant. You'll see that in a minute. And that Vagrant file can be replicated um, to all the VMs you need to spin up. By using a common VM configuration Vagrant file, you can make sure your VMs are set up equally. That's how such an Vagrant file looks like. It's just a block vagrant config do to n, and at that example I have three basic configuration lines. It's what base image is the box based upon. Um, should it run in um, invisible mode, which just spins up the VM in the background and you can SSH into it, or should it use the GUI mode, which uh, VirtualBox uses um, if you are using VirtualBox directly. And a very practical thing is uh, Vagrant will set up port forwarding, forwardings automatically. So if you have a VM running a web server, um, it'll map that web server's port 80 to your host systems, your, to your laptop's uh, system. In that case, if you uh, access localhost colon 8080, you'll reach the web server running inside the VM. So you don't have, again, to deal with the IP address of the VM or uh, doing your port forwardings yourself. Vagrant will take care of that. So let's see how that works. Uh, here we go. So I just do a Vagrant init precise 64. It tells me that it has created a Vagrant file uh, with a default configuration that I can use. Let's see how that looks. So most of these lines are comments. Here is the base box I've used in the init command. Here I can activate the GUI mode if I prefer that. Here I can um, define how the networking should be done with this VM. Um, per default, the VM has a 
local private IP address, uh, but you can uh, connect the network of the VM to your um, uh, host computer's network or even your local network so the VM will be reachable from, for, from your office network, for example. And uh, here's the port forwarding. And there are many different uh, additional config options I won't get into now. So all I have to do is uh, to do a wake rent up to start the VM. Starting it for the first time will take a bit of time because it, it needs to uh, import the, the base box. Uh, all subsequent startups will be more quickly, quick, quickly. All right. Okay, it's almost done. Here we go. And with Vagrant SSH, I can log in into the VM. And I'm ready to go. You could argue that that's not uh, very impressive because you can do that with uh, VM imaging tools uh, provided by VMware or other um, virtual environments as well. So I'll spice it up a bit by introducing the second tool, which is uh, far more important to be able to automate your development setup completely. Its name is Chef and it's built by Opscode. <coughs> Chef uh, will enable you to automate all system administration tasks uh, and by um, defining how your setup should look like, you'll be able to run um, machines that are configured completely equal. It's also Ruby based has a domain-specific language to describe your administration tasks. And it works um, in a way that you define which packages you want to have installed, which configuration files with which contents you, you need. And Chef makes sure that your box looks like uh, you described it. Uh, with every Chef run on the box, it'll check are the packages installed that should be installed, are all the configuration files configured as they should be, and so on, and it makes all the necessary changes. So the first chef run probably will be the most um, long, um, and all subsequent chef runs uh, probably will be very short because everything is already in the state it should be in. Chef um, replaces manual system administration tasks by describing how your system should look like, which uh, in the DevOps world is called infrastructure as code. To that goal, Chef uses different parts, mostly um, cookbooks, which describe um, different softwa software components you want to install. For example, there is a Apache cookbook 
that contains all the details how Apache should be installed, how it should be configured, and gives you the, the opportunity to um, change specific configuration options. Cookbooks consist of different components. For example, recipes. Recipes are a kind of high-level script that uh, say, okay, for example, for Apache, first install Apache, then start the Apache server, then write a configuration file from a template that is predefined in the cookbook, and uh, then uh, every time the configuration file is changed, do a restart of the service. All um, the system components you can at, um, administer with Chef are called resources. I'll come to it uh, on the next slide. And um, all your servers, all your boxes are nodes in ChefSpeak. Every node has attributes, for example, an attribute could be which port should Apache respond on. And to make defining how a web server node, for example, should look, look like uh, as easy as possible, there are roles um, where you can say, okay, the Apache role uh, means that I need the Apache uh, cookbook, I need uh, the MySQL cookbook, I need the PHP cookbook, and uh, predefine certain attributes. Um, so if you, once you have those roles defined, you just say, okay, that's a development machine. And in the role development machine, everything is defined what a development machine means. Chef can maintain all kinds of system components, it can install packages, it can start or stop services, it can create files or directories, um, it can create configuration files from templates, it can run single commands or complete scripts, it can install cron jobs, it can uh, clone git repositories and many th more things. For example, that could be part of the Apache recipe which means take the package Apache 2 and install it. What it means to install a package depends on the operating system you use. Uh, on Red Hat based uh, Linuxes, it'll, be, it'll use RPM to install the Apache package. On Debian based Linuxes, it'll use uh, the app system. Um, that's all uh, behind the chef abstraction layer. You don't need to um, define the actual commands to install the package, you just say install the package and <coughs> Chef takes care of that. Then you can say start the Apache service. Again, how a service is started or stopped depends on the operating system you use. Chef of course knows on which operating system it's running currently, so it can take care of that without you knowing um, exactly what uh, OS you are using at the moment. This could for example, change over time. And then we have a template definition which uh, writes the apache2.conf file. You define which source template in the cookbook should be used and a few options uh, that um, define the permissions and ownerships of the file. And the last line uh, instructs Chef to restart or reload the service if the configuration file has changed. You can find out more about Chef on the different community websites, mainly the Opscode Wiki. On the Opscode community website, you'll find a huge library of cookbooks people have provided as open source. Uh, for example, the Apache cookbooks, there's a MySQL cookbook, an Nginx cookbook, um, and many, many more. And uh, on GitHub, there's also a huge ecosystem of chef cookbooks. Uh, for example, Opscode um, themselves um, provide their own cookbooks, which they maintain under the third URL here. Okay. 
The real magic happens when we combine those two. Vagrant on the one side enables, to, en enables you to easily spin up a VM based on a predefined image, and Chef then will enable you to configure that VM in exactly that way you want it to be. There's not much you'll need. Mostly you'll need the Chef cookbooks. You can download them manually, uh, for example, from the Opscode community website. Uh, all cookbooks are provided as tarballs. You, you, you download them, um, then you uh, unzip them, put them in a directory, and use them to provision a, uh, a Vagrant VM. There's a small tool that makes that task very easy. It's called Chef Librarian. It's another Ruby gem that is simply installed with gem install librarian. You do a librarian chef in it, which creates a basic chef file where you describe what cookbooks exactly you'll need. And with librarian chef install, it'll download those cookbooks you need and put them into your VM directory. Let's do that. So, at the moment, ah, I'm in the VM. Okay, let's get out of here. At the moment, all that is in my directory here is the Vagrant file. So I do a librarian chef in it. Now it's created a chef file that looks like that. It basically defines where to get the cookbooks you order it to install, and then you just define the cookbooks. For example, here's the Apache cookbook. I'll need that for a Drupal development VM. Then we'll need the PHP cookbook. And the MySQL cookbook. Those cookbooks contain um, one or more recipes. For example, the MySQL cookbook contains a recipe to install the MySQL client and another recipe to install the MySQL server. So you can decide which components exactly you want to install. That's all. And then I'll do a librarian chef install. If you grab those three cookbooks, put them inside a directory. So it's very, very easy to get those cookbooks and update them. That's how that looks. And if we take a look into the cookbook directory, you'll see that we have the Apache uh, cookbook, the MySQL cookbook, the PHP cookbook, and since those cookbooks uh, also define which other cookbooks they are dependent upon, um, it already uh, downloaded the Build Essential uh, cookbook, the OpenSSL cookbook, and the XML cookbook, uh, which are needed by one of, uh, of the first three. Now we are good to go. Here's the... Um, Next step, we'll have to define what of those cookbooks we'll want to use. Um, the best way to do that is to define a role which you can reuse and reuse and reuse. Um, that's Ruby again, but as I, I said, it's a domain-specific language, so uh, it's basic Ruby syntax, but uh, um, with uh, keywords that are special to Chef. You define a name of the role and a description and then uh, the main thing is the run list, uh, which defines which recipes should be run in a provisioning cycle. We need the Apache 2 recipe to do the basic Apache installation. <coughs> then there are three additional recipes that install um, special uh, Apache modules. I'll have the recipe to install PHP. Um, I'll add the 
MySQL extension to that. And since I want to run uh, MySQL uh, locally in the VM, I also use the, the MySQL client and the MySQL server cookbook uh, recipe. Pardon. With that definition, you can spin up um, VMs that look the same every time you do a fresh install. And all you need to do to connect Chef and uh, Vagrant is to add a few lines to the Vagrant file. That's totally awesome. I just add a VM provision block that uses Chef. Uh, I'll define where to find the cookbooks. I'll define where to find the role files. And I'll say which role that VM should be. And that's all I need to do. After that, I can just do a Vagrant provision, and uh, Vagrant will run Chef. I'll show you that in a minute. With that, you have a VM that has all the software packages you need, that has all the configuration files uh, you need, and uh, that's, that's a great way to spin up VMs that look the same every time you run them, or in a team setup that look the same on every development workstation. Gone is the problem that your development environments looks totally different from uh, your colleagues. Gone is the problem that uh, introducing a new team member to setting up workstations um, takes a lot of time and errors. So with uh, those tools, you can now do some really awesome stuff. And if you're done, for example, if your project is finished, you just do a Vagrant destroy, which will completely erase your VM, completely delete the VM image you have built, and for a change, that won't be a problem. Every time you need another version of that VM, you just do a Vagrant init, Vagrant up, and you're at the same point uh, as you were previously. That's basically it. Just a few tips um, to speed up the process, process of um, provisioning and uh, installing VMs. Keep your building blocks local. Use a uh, HTTP cache, for example, to cache packages. So every time the provisioning installs, for example, the MySQL package, it won't have to uh, download that from the internet. Uh, store your base boxes at a central place so all your team members can use the same box image and that don't have to uh, download the, the base box onto their um, workstation. With uh, SSD-based laptops, um, disk space is uh, valuable again store your base boxes on a central location, and do, do the same for the cookbooks. So don't download the cookbooks every time you um, install a new development workstation, but uh, put them in a central repository. Put them in a Git repository, for example, so you can see what, what's changed uh, with the cookbooks over time. I'll start my demonstration at the end of my talk because it'll take a bit of time. So I'll already come to my conclusion. By com combining Vagrant and Chef, you have the opportunity to set up dedicated uh, development servers that don't have to be shared between developers. They are configured consistently and they are completely disposable. You can get rid of them every time you want because you can spin them up every time you want and you can be sure that they, they look the same all the time. And it takes a lot of time out of uh, getting new team members into the project because all you have to get them is access to your Vagrant files, your Chef files and your cookbook repository and you're done. Okay, let's see how that works. Um, I already have my cookbooks. I already have my 
chef file. And I already have my Vagrant VM running in the background. So all I have to do is Vagrant provision. That's now running inside the VM. So I just do a Vagrant SSH. isn't so let's do the most e easy thing and just restart the VM ah okay yeah there's a step missing anyone noticed what I forgot to do Yeah, I didn't connect the Vagrant configuration with the Chef configuration. Everything's in place. Now I just have to uh, connect those two in the Vagrant file. So let's go down to the Chef configuration. There's a Puppet uh, installation uh, as well for those of you who already use Puppet. So here we go. Uh, I'll just... need those and modify them a bit since the cookbooks and roles directories are in the same directory I just need that and then I define that VM as a Drupal VM I just have to at the roles directory, get the triple role. Let's take a look at that again. Here's the role that defines which cookbooks and which recipes I'd like to use. I could add um, attributes here as well so if I run my Apache web server on port 81 all the time I can define that here or if I have special configurations that uh, regard the uh, PHP extensions for example um, if I want to define how much memory the APC cache is supposed to use I can add that here as well um, without defining them uh, chef will uh, always use the default settings defined in the cookbook and now I'll do a Vagrant up, which will start the VM again. Should take less time now. And it'll also see that I have a provisioning block in place. And after booting the VM, it'll uh, imme immediately start uh, the chef run, which should be visible here as well. Uh, they are included. Yep. Here we go. It uses the chef directories as shared folders, and now the chef process has started. And it's now processing the package Apache 2 action, which means um, use apt in that case to download and install the Apache 2 package. Since all those downloads take uh, a lot of time on the Wi-Fi here, I decided to put that thing on to the end of my talk. And it'll go on installing packages, creating configuration files, starting up services, and if the chef run 
has finished successfully, I'll have a basic setup running Apache, PHP, and MySQL. Of course, to get a development VM, you'll also add um, configurations. You may want to create uh, document root directories, maybe even download, um, uh, you may even want to download additional uh, Drupal packages, install Rush, and to do things like that. But that's uh, only variations of that thing. That uh, error is quite common with uh, the new Ubuntu version. Um, and uh, I'm quite used to that now. All you need to do is update the package repositories. Um, Vagrant takes care of that. Um, it'll uh, use your um, SSH key f uh, by default and also do a port forwarding from the VM's port 22 to your local port 2222 and connect them to that. So uh, that's what happens if you do an SSH. You could do a SSH minus P2222 um, uh, VM IP as well, but that's a lot more effort than just do a Vagrant SSH. Okay, so we now need to start another provisioning run. Should work now for the second time. And since the Apache package, for example, is already installed, it skips, it, it skips that step and continues immediately with uh, installing the, the PHP module. And from then on, it will continue to do all, everything that's defined inside the cookbooks. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Okay. So, um, well, how did I get here? Let's do a step back. Here's the, the Drupal role file again. And here's the step I missed uh, uh, at the first time to integrate Chef with Vagrant in the Vagrant file. Okay, and that's basically it. From then on, you'll be able to uh, create your own VMs without much effort. All the effort goes into uh, define your basic environment one time, share that definition with all your colleagues and project members, and then just use that handful of commands, uh, Vagrant up, Vagrant provision, to get your VMs running. That's all days to do, and so you can focus again on building awesome Drupal websites. Thank you. The question was, how do I handle the subtle differences between those nodes, between those VMs? You'll do that uh, using the chef attributes. Every chef node, so every chef, uh, every server you deploy with chef has its own attributes. And you can define those attributes either on a node by node basis. So you can say, okay, on this node, Apache runs on port 80. On another node, Apache runs on port 81. Um, if all your uh, VMs are equal in that way, so if you say, um, my Apache always runs on port 80, for example, which is the default, so let's say Apache runs on port 81. Uh, you put that attribute into the role, 
So by assigning that role to your VM, you not only assigning it the list of recipes to ex execute, but also the, those special attributes that most of the time uh, land somewhere in your configuration files. That's uh, what node attributes are for. There are many ways to do that, and that depends on your development cycle. The question was, how, now, if I spin up that VM, how do, we, do, do I work with that? Ha, do I have to SSH into the VM and edit PHP files there, or, or how do I do that? Um, that depends on how you are used to doing your development. Um, the, the most straightforward way, of course, is doing an SSH into the VM, doing all your changes, uh, checking them via the web server and seeing if, it, if the result is what you want. Uh, that's a bit tedious, I think. So you could as well use the shared folder um, option of uh, VirtualBox where you can um, define a folder inside the VM to be accessible on your host system, on your laptop, for example. And uh, if you, so you can use, uh, for example, the, the, the tools that are installed on your laptop to edit files, to change files, and um, that way you may only have to log into the machine to restart the web server or do s things like that. Yeah, that's for example how um, Vagrant made the cookbooks I have installed locally on my laptop to the VM. It just created a uh, virtual folder so the chef running inside the VM could access the cookbooks I had installed on my laptop here. Mm, so the question is, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, how do I get a quick start with an existing um, development environment uh, and make that rep uh, able to replicate between VMs? Um, most of the time you have to put in the effort of uh, defining all the, these parameters for one time. Um, we are planning, for example, to provide our customers with uh, special cookbooks that are based on the cookbooks we are using to deploy our production system. Um, so these cookbooks are simplified versions of what we are using on our infrastructure and our customers will be able to use these uh, cookbooks uh, to spin up a development environment that's in many parts is completely uh, equal to what we are running in production. So uh, if, if you take the effort of uh, defining that uh, for one time, you'll uh, have a lot of productivity afterwards. Yeah, uh, Blueprint is a kind of re-engineering your existing uh, system, looking which packages are already installed, um, but that's already, if I think it through, uh, where the problem starts, so it can't just use the complete package list and uh, create a, a recipe for that. For example, if I install Apache, the Apache, Apache package, um, all the dependencies will be uh, automatically be taken care of, and uh, I don't want to have a, a huge list of uh, dependencies explicitly uh, listed in my role file. Um, I think it could be a quick start 
uh, you will have to um, clean out the, the result of that. And I don't actually know which is more effort, uh, starting from scratch or starting from such a blueprint. Just come, come, uh, come forward to the mic so we can hear you. Take a look at it. Uh, well, we, we are almost done, by the way. We are already done at the MySQL part of things. The question was, well, if, I've, uh, if I'm done with uh, developing, how do I get the results I've achieved on my uh, development VM up to the production environment? Uh, the answer, the short answer is that depends. Uh, it again depends on how you do your deployment. Um, for example, you could use uh, Drush logged in locally to the VM to do a SyncDB, to uh, upload the files on your VM, um, to your production server. In our case, our complete deployment is Git-based, so you'll access the Git repository used on the development machine and just do a Git push to the production environment. Um, uh, there are all kinds of ways to, to achieve that result, and it uh, really depends on uh, what environment you use in production, uh, who's your provider, if you are running it yourself, or if there's uh, some kind of PAS as ours, for example. And, um, uh, basically, you have all the, the tools at your disposal. Uh, you can drush, install Drush on your VM here. Um, you can use FTP outside the VM. If your VM is connected to your local network, you can use just FTP to, to upload your files to a production system. There are all kinds of ways. <coughs> ah, okay. How, how do I make sure my development environment looks like the production environment? Um, the best way to do that is, of course, use the same cookbooks uh, that you are using here locally on your machine, uh, using the chef server and client system, which is a bit more complex, um, to run uh, the, your infrastructure on the same code base. So we are back to the infrastructure as code. Um, for example, uh, the same cookbook I used to spin up Apache here is used in our production environment to uh, run Apache there by making sure we are using the same cookbooks and the same cookbook versions on both the development and the production environments, we can be completely sure that they are identical. No, we don't. Um, you can use just the chef's, we are running a, a dedicated chef server 
which has a huge database of all our nodes, all the attributes those nodes have, and so on. And on every server, uh, we are running our infrastructure on bare metal servers, not on some kind of VMs. Um, yeah, yeah, we just do a chef client run, which connects to the chef server, gets all the cookbooks, gets all the um, attributes, and uh, all the things we've defined over time. And then it'll run the same installation process you can see here. Yeah, um, basically, if you're using that uh, tool chain here, for example, you would just add another cookbook or another recipes to the role file. And if, if uh, your convention is to use that role file all the time by updating the role file and running vagrant provision on the different VMs, um, uh, it'll install your new package, do your new configuration files or things like that. You, you just share those basic coded definitions like the role file and uh, Chef and Vagrant will take care of that. So let's just, uh, the Chef run has finished by the way. I'll just check back with that. This here is the central part, the role file which defines which recipes to run, maybe also which attributes to use when configuring those services. So by maintaining that file and sharing it between your developers, um, you can make sure that every development workstation, every development VM looks the same. What's happening here? There we go. That's what I would suggest, yeah. Just create a central repository on a file server or on a central Git repository and maintain your vagrant files and especially those uh, role and uh, recipe files um, on the Git repository and uh, tell your colleagues to do a Git pull from time to time and do a vagrant uh, uh, provision from time to time. Uh, a provisioning run, by the way, is also done every time you vagrant up. So when you're, uh, you're restarting a VM, it'll also do a provisioning run. So if you make sure that cookbooks and roles are uh, up to date all the time, you can be sure that your VMs are too. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's completely based on VirtualBox. Uh, you, you'll basically do the same uh, as we are doing in production. You just um, run Chef directly on your uh, VMware uh, provisioned uh, VMs. You just skip the first half of, of my presentation and go uh, directly to the co uh, Chef configuration. Um, uh, since VMware already provides you with v VMs based on a central image most of the time, you'll just do the configuration management then. Chris? Any more questions? Mm 
that's an interesting thought, and I, I think it comes down to DevOps culture. Um, uh, I can't speak for a corporate IT department, um, uh, but I can talk about opportunities here. Um, using a tool like Chef that uh, uh, that focuses system management down to maintaining text files uh, at least enables you to participate in uh, this system management. So for, for example, you could uh, really provide uh, your IT department with a, uh, such a role file, for example, uh, telling them, okay, look, uh, we need to uh, download and install Apache, we need MySQL, um, and um, we'll need PHP, uh, PHP should be, be configured that APC has 64 uh, megabytes of, uh, of RAM at the least, things like that, uh, which you uh, as a developer can uh, define better than the IT department that doesn't know about your application. Um, they as well can then um, define other things like uh, buffer sizes in MySQL uh, or uh, some, some really uh, uh, down to the metal things that the IP, IT department is concerned with, not you as a developer as much. And uh, you can throw your know-how together in those files. Um, so you don't, the, the IT department doesn't need to give you SSH access to do your configuration, which will, they will never do. Um, and it, it also enables you to um, give your recommendations for the environment in a more um, IT-like way than just emailing them. So I think uh, tools like Chef at least enable you to uh, do dev ops together instead of you doing your dev stuff and they doing their ops stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are uh, solutions for the same problem. So you can just replace the chef configuration in your Vagrant file. Oh, that wasn't it. Uh, I'm inside the VM. If you look closely, you'll find that before the chef configuration block, there is a puppet configuration block. So you can just use that block and uh, define a puppet, um, you define your puppet configurations, for example, the address of your central uh, puppet server, and uh, use that to spin up your VMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah the default configuration as well is, is with puppet is to run a local puppet binary that's not dependent on any outside servers, uh, uh, as was my chef configuration as well. You didn't see me configuring some kind of chef server or something like that, but you can do that. If you have a puppet server or an, a, a chef infrastructure in place, you just point Vagrant to that and it'll take care of it. Basically, you're not thinking in terms of commands you have to execute and files you have to edit. Uh, you, uh, that boil, everything boils down to maintaining those text files, like the role file. Um, and you can use all the tools you have at your disposal to share those files. Create central Git repositories, send them via email, um, work on them in a distributed team. Everything that's possible uh, with a text file you can use to your advantage. Anything else that prevents us from going to lunch? 
Okay, Moses. Uh, we can do that afterwards. Thank you.